Um, my name is Laura McInerney. I obviously was doing the panel earlier. I was been an education journalist about five years now, formerly the editor of Schools Week. But also, about a year ago, got involved in this weird experiment. And I expect that some of you have been involved. If you were at the big national research ed in September, which is where we launched Teach the Tap, then you will already have heard about it beforehand. Essentially, what happened about this time last year is that Professor Becky Allen, who's at Data Lab, was asked by Nesta if she could create some piece of technology, what would she like, because they had a bit of extra cash hanging around. And she'd thought about a survey tool for teachers. Really unusually in teaching, there were around 500,000 teachers in Britain. So it's half a million people. It's one of the biggest professions. And yet we don't know very much about teachers at all. So we don't really know what time they get to work. We don't know what time they leave work. We don't know where they eat their lunch. And Becky and I, for many years, have had this one driving question, which is, how many classrooms does an average secondary school teacher teach in, and does that affect your attention? So the more classrooms you teach in, does that make you more likely to want to leave? And if any of you have ever taught in your own classroom versus moved around the school, you may well know that it does make a big difference. And so she asked about creating a survey app, we came up with the idea of TeachTap, and what it does is every day at 3.30, um, it asks teachers a question. So you can get it on your phone, it's free, we don't ask for many details at all. But we've now started asking teachers every single day three questions every day of the year. And it's enabling us to build up for the first time ever a really good picture of what teachers do in their working lives. So a bit like Graham Nuttall's The Hidden Lives of Learners, we're starting to find out the secret life of teachers. We've currently got 2,000 users a day answering the questions, about 2,500 per week. It's very sticky, so people who start on it, if you last about a week, then usually you'll stick with us. Even on Christmas Day at that time, we had 1,500 users and 1,320 answered on Christmas Day. And we did just ask about arguments with the family, so uh, it was quite funny. And the reason they do that is that you answer the three questions. Our data shows it takes about seven seconds per question, except on question three, where people must get a bit distracted sometimes, and then they come back again. Um, but in total, it takes about seven seconds per question. And then you get to see the questions from the day before, so you get to find out if we've asked, for example, about... Brexit, did you vote for Remain or leave in Brexit? You can find out how similar or different you are to the rest of the country the next day. And then you also get a daily tip which works like Power CPD. Essentially, it's a few lines from a blog. So we tell you what the blog is about. We'll tell you how long it takes to read the blog. Most of them are about three to five minutes. So it just means at the end of the day, when you get your phone back, there are three questions. It might be something like, did you give out a detention today? How long did you spend planning the second lesson of the day? Did behaviour disrupt at any point in the day? And it will give you some results, and it will also give you um, the tip. Now, what we're doing for the first time is we're able, as soon as the government puts out a policy, to start finding out what teachers think about it. And this has been incredibly powerful in a few different areas. So one example was the times tables check. Now, most of you, especially if you're in primary, you'll have known for a long time that the multiplication check was on the cards. It moved to year four, and the, the uh, newspapers earlier this year put it out and said, you know, it was hated, the teaching unions came out and they said they didn't like it. If you would watch the news, you would believe that most teachers were absolutely against the multiplication check. Now, we looked, and actually we found 53% either tended to agree or agreed with the idea of a multiplication check. So around half of the profession agreed. In the middle, we had a few more. And there was a big debate about whether it would be different between primary and secondary. We can tell. Because we collect so much data on each and every person, we can actually split it by everything else. So in this case, we were able to see if primary teachers liked it um, as much as secondary. There are some differences, but it's not as big as everybody would have us believe. So very quickly, we were able to go to the government and say, actually, this is what teachers think. Across the 2,000 in our sample, we are able to reweight on observables. So what that means is we can look at differences between male, female, secondary teachers, primary teachers, teachers of different ages, different experience lengths. 
and we can then reweight the answers if it seems important to match the workforce using the workforce census. At the moment, we're slightly overprescribed male and secondary, and slightly undersubscribed from female, primary, and special needs schools. So, if any of you have colleagues within that, if you can get everyone in your school to sign up, teach tap, as I say, it's free, it's very easy, seven seconds of for each of those questions, um, it gives us a much, much better sample. At 2000, we're already starting to do quite interesting things, and it's better than any other day poll um, around um, in terms of teachers. But if we can get up to 4000, what we are looking to do is start looking at clusters of teachers. So at the moment, for instance, we're trying to work out are there certain types of teacher when it comes to workload and morale, and what can we do to nudge their behavior. Today, however, I thought uh, what I'd do is give you some of the most interesting findings, and then actually talk about workload, because we're starting to find out exactly what's driving workload, and some of the findings are controversial, I've had people literally come up and shout at me, so I will be ready at the end if any of you want to scream at me outside. It won't be unusual. Um, but these are conversations we absolutely start, have to start having. Um, this was a really interesting little experiment we did. So we decided to ask, do you know who the best teachers are in your schools? We wanted to see if teachers felt confident that they were able to rate themselves and others in the school. As you can see, most people either said definitely yes or I have a good idea of who they are. So most people are pretty confident that they can identify good teachers. We then asked, how good do you think you are a few days later? So if you were judged on teaching quality, where within your school do you think you would score? And amazingly, you will notice 74% of people think they are above average. Anyone figured out a slight problem with that one? <laughs> now this is a really, really common phenomenon. You see it all across psychology. If you ask people to rate their driving skills, if you ask people to rate how calm they are, if you ask people to rate um, how personable they are, you'll pretty much see that 75% of people will tend to say they're above average. But one thing we were able to do was to look at who were the people who said that you could pick out the best, and did that have any impact on whether or not they thought they were the best? And when we looked, as you'll see, those who think they are very, very, very good in the top 25% of teaching were also the people most likely to say, definitely, you can tell who the good teachers are. So if you were in the panel earlier when Craig said, as long as you're confidently wrong, that's better for you, what we find is the people who are all convinced they're in the top 25% are more likely to really believe they've also got the answer uh, correct, which is also important when we think about changing teachers' practice. If so many teachers believe that they are above average, and they really trust their own judgment on this, it is quite difficult to get teachers to believe that what they are doing is incorrect. You actually have to have quite a high evidence level before lots of teachers will change. That's not because there's something weird about teachers. All humans tend to have this same pattern. But what it does show is that when we say, I am willing to be convinced by evidence, we are no more likely to listen to evidence than anybody else. We are as susceptible to believing that we are brilliant, and we are as susceptible to believing that that, that perception is correct. So the key findings around workload that I want to present today are going to sound initially like they're quite obvious, and yet they are important. If any of you are in senior leadership, I would recommend you just jotting these down in particular to talk with your own senior leaders about, because it is something that whenever we've presented them to senior leadership teams so far, they, they are quite shocked. If you're a classroom teacher, it may be less shocking for you because you live this every day. However, it's still always, I think, quite comforting to hear what other people are saying. So the first finding in the last uh, six months on this is that teachers have an incredibly busy day. And that's obviously true because of the amount of hours that they spend teaching, but we also have asked about this. So I just want you to take a few minutes and see if you can guess, across schools, what percentage of teachers do you think do additional duties three or more a week? What percentage of teachers run extracurricular clubs after school? What percentage have three or more after school meetings in a week? What percentage spend three or more hours marking each week? And what percentage mark for more than seven hours per week? 
We're going to give you about a minute and a half to think so you can come up with a rough number for each one. What's amazing is how many head teachers don't even know where to begin when we present this to them. So, the difficulty we had when we first started is we had no way of even beginning to guess how to answer the question. Usually most teachers sort of work out what they do, then they try and proxy how unusual they think they are. So they'll take the first one and they'll think, I do three or more duties, do the ten teachers I know best do that, do some teachers in some other schools do it, and then they roughly guess from that. But of course, you are likely to spend more time with teachers like yourself. The schools that you know, and the people that you know in other schools may be more like yourself. And actually, your ability to grasp what anybody else is doing on a daily basis in teaching is actually quite limited. And it is incredible that head teachers in particular um, struggle with this. I've had some groups who get it pretty bang on, but most are miles off. So this is what we found. 60% of teachers do additional duties for three or more times a week. That includes break duties, lunch duties, after school duties. People do forget about those because they're only short blocks of time, maybe 20 minutes or so. But when you put those on top of a full teaching load, it's another hour and a half and it takes out periods of time that are essentially breaks or rejuvenation. So if you think then if you do a break duty and you have a lesson afterwards, that's PPA time, but actually your break needs to be built into that PPA time. 50% run extracurricular clubs after school. We find that's higher in primary and we find it's very seasonal. So primary school teachers will tend to run a club at a certain point in the year. Some people will do a sport in the summer or the winter. But at any one time, around 50% of teachers are running an extracurricular club. This is the one that senior leaders never believe and we've spent the whole year having a battle about, which is that we found that 50% of teachers had three or more after school meetings. Now last week we ran some figures on this and we started asking people what the meetings were that they were going to. We again found around half of teachers had three or more meetings after school. We don't think that figure is as far off as everybody believes. The issue is not so much department meetings or um, sort of standardised meetings, it's really that teachers often have to meet for other reasons. They're meeting a parent, they might be organising a trip, there might be some kind of textbook decision they've got to make, it could be that there's going to be a visit and they want to organise things. So what's happening is senior leaders are forgetting that teachers also have work that they create themselves, and I don't mean that they've created it and they don't need to do it, it's that teaching requires you to speak to colleagues at a set time, there are not many times in the day where we get hold of each other, and therefore, you quite often have to say, we will see each other at 3.30. Again, if senior leaders are only seeing what they give to teachers as the totality of workload, but teachers have extra things to do, then we end up with this situation, where we've now got a teacher who could be teaching 22 or 23 hours, doing a break duty, a lunch duty, and an after school duty. On Monday, they're running an extra, club, an extra school, uh, club after school. Three nights of the week, they're then in meetings. And 75% say, say they spend three or more hours marking each week, with 18% marking for seven hours. And what's incredible is, if you take three hours on a weekend, actually, over a year, that ends up being nearly an extra three weeks' worth of work. So when we talk about a 13 week vacation holiday, and actually some of that is already taken out with other stuff anyway, three weeks is taken out for the majority of people just by marking. Because the number of people who can manage to do it in PPA time is basically nil. I mean, PPA time is, is in some places where it's been planned very well and more so in primary it's used, but it doesn't tend to cover the expectations. 
So we've started presenting this increasingly to academy trust leaders, to head teachers, to local authorities and to central government because we think this is actually what's driving the feeling that teaching is a very, very busy day. If you then add on to all of this busyness, marking load, and we've asked how often schools have policies that you must mark, we see that primary teachers in particular have um, daily or most lesson expectations on marking around literacy. At secondary, it's around fortnightly, but especially science teachers, when we, dro when we dove into it, science teachers have one of the most insane marking expectations because they teach a lot more classes than you might think, and they have to do them fortnightly. When we start adding all of this together, what we see is that marking is, uh, is quite extensive. However, this is one where teachers have some responsibility. Because we asked people about their marking, how many hours are you doing? We asked for a few weeks. And then a few weeks later, we asked teachers, if no one knew, Ofsted weren't going to check your marking, if your head teacher wasn't going to check your marking, if no one was going to see your marking, how much would you reduce it by? And what we found was that about half of people wouldn't reduce it very much, and it didn't matter how much they were marking. So the people who were marking for 10 hours said they would carry on marking for 10 hours, just as much as people who marked for 5 hours or for 15 hours. So there is something about marking workload which is being driven by school expectations, but even if schools withdrew that expectation, teachers believe it's really, really important. So this argument that Dylan William has made, which is that marking is the most expensive PR game in history, that essentially teachers believe they have to do it, is true. And taking that away from teachers, even if leaders and senior leaders and Ofsted said it didn't need to be done, it's going to be very difficult unless something is put in its place. Because I think teachers want to feel like there is at least a mechanism by which they can feed back to pupils. So it's not going to work to just say marketing has to stop. Teachers will feel very uneasy if you do that, unless they're given an alternative. But if we don't do something about marking, at minimum, it's taking out three weeks a year, and it's on top of an already very, very, very busy week. To add to that very, very busy day, teaching feels like a very long day. And this is where I'm going to start getting controversial, because it sounds like I'm being glib when I say some of the things I'm about to say, and I'm not. Having worked as a teacher for six years, I know that I did all of these things, I know why people do these things, but we have to recognise the problem. 40% of teachers get to work before 7.30am. They get up incredibly early. Teachers are up between about 5am and 6.30am. Um, I say 40% before 7.30am, almost everybody else before 8am. I know why this happens. It is a job where you cannot be late. Like There is no ifs and buts for teaching. It's not like almost any other job that like, you just cannot be late. And if you cannot be late and you've got to go through rush hour traffic or public, trans uh, public transport commuting, you tend to go early. The problem is that teachers who tell us they get to work early tell us how much they love it. They think it's great, they wouldn't want someone to stop them doing it. And when you look at them as a group and you look at their work morale, they have some of the lowest work-life balance and some of the lowest work morale. So people think they like getting to work early, but the other data tells us that they're not very happy as individuals. They spend over an hour commuting each day, many of them, but then at night, we ask one day, um, how many of you marked books in front of the television last night? We expected, because it was such a specific question, for it to be quite low. And we actually found it was 41% were marking in front of the television the night before. So when you add this together, what we find is that teachers get up unreasonably early, much earlier than their friends. They then travel, they then get to work really early. We're not entirely sure what they do between 7.30 a.m. and about 8.30 and 9.00 a.m. They all tell us they're incredibly productive, but we're not so convinced. They then have to battle through hours and hours of teaching, break duty, extracurricular activities, meetings, marking. We haven't even got into planning and planning requirements. They then get to the end of the day, they do their meeting, they do their teacher tap, they get in their car, they drive an hour home, 
they make their tea, they do a bit of housework, they sit down, and then in front of the television, they're marking books, and many don't go to bed until between 10 and 11 p.m., which is about average, but most of them have been up incredibly early. Which means if you ask teachers how long they worked on any one day, you will typically get an answer that is a minimum of 10 hours, but can go up to 15 or 17 hours, largely because they tend to go from when it began to when it ended. But how much of that day is productive is very, very, very difficult even now for us to get a handle on. And one of the things we think is happening is that PPA is trapped in all kinds of unhelpful places. And so Professor Becky Allen, who I work with, who works on the app with me, has come up with a theory. And her theory is that two things that should have been good for us as a profession destroyed working practices. One is PPA time, and the other one is money. Because in the 2000s, in the early 2000s, when PPA was brought in as a way of teachers being able to do their planning and their marking, particularly around the national strategies, what happened is that it seemed to become magical time. So although it's only a few hours, apparently within those few hours, you can do an unlimited number of tasks. There is no end to what you can be asked to do in a time that is sort of equivalent to about 12 minutes per lesson. But you can plan, you can mark, you can do all of your paperwork, you can enter your data, you can sort out behavior. You are a miracle worker, simply because PPA exists. The second thing is that when all of the money went into schools in the 2000s, many, many schools used it to hire managers, and they did so because Ofsted moved to an audit culture. So instead of thousands of inspectors all turning up like they used to and spending days and days with you, we moved to a system where fewer inspectors came, but they would look at evidence. And so those managers' job was to basically get evidence. And so they went to the teachers and they said, hey, you've now got a few hours of PPA time, so what I want you to do in your few hours of PPA time is create this unlimited amount of evidence. And so we've ended up in a world where there is a requirement for lots of data, lots of documentation, lots of planning, and much of it has helped improve teaching and learning, but it's gone way beyond what you can actually ask. And then on the other hand, people whose job it is to basically chase this, and that drives all kinds of strange and perverse incentives into the system. So, we now find ourselves in a situation where 70% of teachers say they work more than 10 hours. Around 22% say they work more than 12 hours on any one day that we ask. And it means that people feel really quite unhappy about their work-life balance compared to their friends, compared to partners, compared to um, people in other jobs. And aside, actually, because I haven't got the data on this, if you do want to know the people who are happiest with their workload, um, we, we know quite a lot about teacher tax partners and relationship status. It's, everyone tells us everything is great. It's completely anonymous. It's, 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 it's done well, so there's no fear about it. But we thought that people might be a bit cagey, and they don't. They tell us everything. And um, we've discovered that if you are in a relationship with a teacher, of which 25% of teachers are, um, your work-life balance is better it's even better if you don't have children, and it's even better if you're head teachers. So if you want the best work-life balance, um, and you can, you, know, you can make your life fashion in this way, just find yourself a nice head teacher, become a head teacher, and try not to have any children. Everything will be sorted for you, no problems. Um, if you can't do that, I have one other good suggestion. And it, come from, it came from this question. So over Christmas, we asked people, did you set an out of office reply on your emails? Uh, and as you can see, 50% said no because they were checking their emails. And around 50% either just ignored them or they said yes, saying they'll be back after their holidays. Nothing else we've done on TeachTap has caused as much controversy as this. Whenever I've presented this to people, it gets a really strong reaction. Because the 50% who check their emails I like, I have to do that. I get very anxious. I wouldn't want to come back on the first day and feel like I'm overwhelmed. I like, I love checking my email. It's all good. I totally love it. Don't take my email off of me. Um, I have to do it. But the other 50% then get very angry. And they say, well, you checking your email means me that I feel like I have to check 
my email. And the other half go, yeah, but you don't really, that's not what I want, it's about my work-life balance, I just really like my life being so flexible. And these guys are going, yeah, but your flexibility is affecting me. No, 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 it's really not affecting you. And I think there's a real problem with this debate right now. Because the half who want the flexibility are not hearing the other half, who are saying, it is impacting on me. And this is the bit where I've had people screaming at me. Because they're saying, we just all have to be grown-ups, these people have to accept that other people want to control over their lives. And I hear that. But these guys are saying, your control and the way you're dealing with this is affecting me. And even more worrying is what we found out last week, which was when we asked people, what are you required to use for work? Required. And you'll notice 2% have WhatsApp on there. We had reports from a number of teachers that their schools are now requiring them to have WhatsApp groups. There are people who are required to have Slack on their phone. They are required to monitor Facebook groups. We had teachers come and speak to us who've got 24-hour email policies, including at the weekend. If a pupil or a parent contacts them at the weekend, they are expected to respond within 24 hours. Of everything we have seen so far in Teacher Tap, I think the email issue and then increasingly the social media issue is a problem. Because what is happening is that people's need or desire or want to do things off-site and at home, and I get it because I'm very much the sort of person myself, is making other people anxious and may even be making themselves anxious. And someone described this yesterday as a monkey. And they said, imagine you've got a monkey sort of jumping up and down on your back and at nine o'clock at night, you're like, oh, I didn't deal with the monkey. I'll send an email because that gets the monkey off onto somebody else. But now that person on their phone in the evening, who might be just happily chatting to the, you know, their daughter or whatever, has now got the monkey appear on their phone and it's 9.30 and they feel like they need to deal with the monkey because they don't want to wake up at 6 a.m. and still have it jumping around on their back. The simplest solution is to use something like Boomerang, if you use Gmail, which enables you to schedule emails so that you can still write them in the evening, but they don't send until much later. I've had CEOs of Academy Trust, when they've been presented with this, suggest to their staff they turn email off Friday 9 p.m. to Monday 6 a.m. Uh, when one Academy Trust CEO stood up and suggested that, one of his primary head teachers slammed their hand on the desk and shouted, no, and the thought, just the sheer thought that for one weekend on an experiment she wouldn't have her email was enough to make her like panic and melt down. But I think that shows us how addicted almost we are to the idea of being able to do what we want when we want as being really, really important and not accepting that what we want to do might have a negative consequence for somebody else. And as someone said outside, you know, sending an email at 9 o'clock at night to me now is just like, I've decided it's just rude. It's like how no one used to phone our house after 9 o'clock at night. I mean, you know, it had to be a death. You imagine when the phone used to ring at like half 9. Ooh, what's happened? <laughs> you know, like, ooh, something major. Is it your pop? You know, and so I think we need to get back into a mindset, potentially, where we think about what is rude? Like, what is just mean? And we shouldn't be doing in terms of work-life balance. But I also understand that that is quite controversial. Um, the third bit then is this thing that we've uncovered, which is that amazingly, as much as people may say that teachers uh, want more pay, actually, teachers appear to want to work for free. We heard this question, sorry, we heard this statement all the time when we started looking into flexible working and part-time working. And we heard so many people saying, I would love to work a four-day week because I would like Friday off to do all the stuff that I currently do on Sunday and then I could do it on the Friday and then I could like spend the weekend with my kids. But we've currently got a very, very small number of 21-year-olds. We have a very small number of 21-year-olds for the next five years. Any of you in secondary college will have just gone through this demographic dip, right? So the number of graduates is going to be actually really small for a few years. And getting them to come into teaching, it turns out, is really difficult. Because the salaries ain't that great. 
They're currently now saddled with an enormous amount of debt, sky-high house prices, and we are essentially saying to these young people, and if you want to become a teacher, by the way, and you have to do five days of work because that's what you need to afford your life, you're just never going to have a weekend. Thanks, guys. It can't be possible. We cannot make this job a job that can only be done if you take a fifth day off to do all of this stuff for free. And yet, we found if we uh, gave teachers a free choice, would they like to change their contractual hours of work? We had most of them say uh, no on this one, but they would. Uh, some would like to decrease their hours. We then asked them in an ideal world and taking into account any loss of salary, so accepting they would lose salary, how many days a week would you work? And we got four as the highest number. We kept asking in different iterations, and four day weeks is always the most popular for teachers. We thought this might be driven by gender because we were told it was to do with families. Actually, um, it wasn't driven by gender. It wasn't driven by having children. People without children are as likely to pick four days, are as likely to say they want to decrease their hours. The only thing that did drive it was whether or not your partner earns substantially less or more than you. So if you are in a part, if you're in a relationship with someone who earns more than you, you are more likely to say you'll work three days. If you're the main breadwinner in your family, you'll want to stick at five days. And that does affect men and women differently. We've got good data on it. But essentially, almost always now when we ask, around 40% of teachers say they want to drop down to a fourth day, a four-day week. That's equally true across men and women, equally true across people uh, who have children and who don't. The only difference is your spousal income. But we have a major, major problem, which is this. If we suddenly make part-time working really attractive, which is what the government is trying to do because it thinks it will retain teachers, if 40% of teachers drop just one day per week, we would actually need 40,000 extra teachers to make up for that loss in time. That's the equivalent of 10% of all teachers coming back into the profession full time to do it. And given that most people who want to come back and be retained want to be part time workers, we would actually be looking at something like 60,000 teachers needed. We currently train around 19,500 PGC students a year. So you would essentially need three extra years worth of PGC students if we make part time working easier. Which leaves us with this final conclusion. Teaching is a busy day. There's no getting away from it. We can do a few things about it, but it is a very busy day. It feels like a very long day. One solution I have seen, I visited a school this week that does all of its meetings before school. All of them. Because it was like, our staff are here early anyway. They're faffing about not doing anything. If we gave them their actual meetings at the beginning of the day, then that shortens the day and they can go home. Um, we then ended up with teachers therefore wanting to do a four day week and we're starting to see the creep of social media into uh, the, rest of, the rest of the week. Which has led me to this conclusion. I am worried that flexible working, and I don't mean part time working, I literally mean the idea that we can do tasks anytime we want, whenever, at home, we can email. I'm worried that flexible working is basically a deep fried Mars bar. So when I was at school, I loved deep fried Mars bars. Loved them. And I would go off site every day, and I'd go to the fish and chip shop, and I'd eat deep fried Mars bars. If you've never had one, they're delicious. I mean, they're like donuts with chocolate and caramel inside. Hot. I mean, they're just delicious, right? And you want more. Like, you like them. You like the taste of them. I ate one every single day. And then in my year 11, we got a new head teacher, and he stopped us going to the chip shop. And I couldn't have my fried Mars bar anymore. And I was furious about this fact. When I look back, just because I wanted the Mars bar, just because I liked the Mars bar, it did not mean that the deep fried Mars bars was good for me. Actually, it was right that somebody came along and said, you cannot have more Mars bars. And I am concerned that there is something very, very persuasive about flexible working. It's something we like a lot. I like being able to work from home. I like being able to write my emails at 9 p.m. I like having all of this control over my life, but just because I like it doesn't mean it's good for me. And even worse, it might be bad societally. It might even be okay for one individual to eat those Mars bars all day long. But if we all did it, all of the time, we would end up with an obesity problem, 
And I am concerned that if what we do is we get very, very flexible with our work, and we start saying, you can get me on Slack anytime, you can get me on WhatsApp anytime, we can email anytime, you can work any amount of hours and it can be completely flexible, we will end up with a sort of form of work obesity. It will become an addiction for which there are no boundaries. So there are some simple things. I do think having schedulers on emails, I think at least speaking to your staff about out of office policies, about what the guidelines are for how you do it, is really important. And I think we need to think about if we go for a system where you can do fewer days per week, how you put a boundary on what that actually means for being able to contact one another and for the work. I'm not saying you can never do work outside of, of, of your you know, set hours, but I think you have to be careful of when people can turn around and say enough is enough. Otherwise, what we've ended up with is a system where because you have a few hours of PPA, managers are essentially able to load as many tasks onto you as they want. They can ask you to do duties, they can ask you to do after school meetings, they can ask you to do hours and hours of lessons, and then you can also be asked to plan to do three weeks worth of marking at a minimum and answer emails, do everything else that you need to do. So, in the 25 weeks of Teach Tap, the secret life of teachers, what we have essentially learned is that you guys are busy for very, very long days, but if we're not careful, we're all going to get really fat on Mars bars. <laughs> That's it. Thank you.